First of all, I would like to thank you all for coming out today. My name is Linda Bocanegra, and I'm the Vice President for the Westwood Square Neighborhood Association. And I'm also the restaurant owner here, so uh, we're going to get this meeting started. And uh, Velma, you ready? Here's yeah. Velma Benya, our President. Thank you, Velma. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Like she said, I'm Velma Pena with the Westwood Square and then also with the West Side Neighborhood Associations Coalition. Sorry. And uh, first, we're going to do the, we're going to do do it a little bit different this time. We're going to do the announcements first. The presidents that are here from the uh, coalition is just going to do you know they're going to do their announcements as far as what's going on in their neighborhoods. So Rudy um, Lopez from Thompson Neighborhood Association. Good evening, everybody. It's like Velma said, I'm Rudy Lopez. I'm with the Thompson, I'm the president of the Thompson Neighborhood Association. I just got like three or four announcements to make real quick. We got some projects that we're working on in the Thompson area. Uh, the first one, I, and I passed out flyers, so y'all should have some flyers, but the first one is our Suclovia. That's going to be March 24th from 10 to 6 o'clock. Uh, if y'all ever heard of Suclovia, uh, that's where the, they, they go in and close the streets so that folks can actually ride their bikes and walk around that day and it's close to vehicular traffic. Um, so that's what we're doing over in the Thompson area. We're inviting you out to go and spend a day walking down John McMullen, Roselawn, and Thompson. Uh, we'll have several things out there. We're going to have uh, a lot of city informational tables. We're going to have vendors in the park. We're going to have a fitness stage, a fitness van. We'll be raffling off bicycles, raffling off tickets for AFC Theater. So. Come and join us on that day. It's going to be spectacular. You're going to have a good time. Uh, the second thing that we have going on, and again, you should have a flyer for that, is we've partnered up with Kaboom, a nonprofit, and CarMax to build a new playground in Kennedy Park. Uh, the only stipulation with that, when we're working with when we're working with Kaboom, is that we got to find volunteers to help us build a park in a day. Uh, so. You should have flyers out there, and if you don't, you can get them at the table back here. It has a website where you can register for to volunteer. Uh, now, the third thing we have going on is we have a bus trip going to Kickapoo, and that's going to be May 26. The money that all the money that we make off the bus trip is going to scholarships for students over at Kennedy High School. So, if you're interested in that as well, grab a flyer, give me a call, or give my vice president a call. Let us know that you all want to go, and we'll set you up for that. Uh, lastly. One of the things that Velma was asking me about is, have you all seen the construction that's going on over at Couples and Highway 90? Yes. Do you all know what that is? No. Okay, that's going to be a Baptist Emergency Hospital. What? Okay. It's an emergency hospital. It's an it's emergency hospital. So this is going to be a lot like, have you seen the emergency hospital for South Simone 35? Yes. Okay, it's going to be just like that one. Okay, that, that one's going to hold 80 to 100 patients. It's a 24-hour care hospital. They'll be able to do inpatient and take care of patients overnight, however long they need to stay. They'll be doing surgeries there as well. You have an emergency, you break an arm, you cut yourself, you go straight down there and they'll accept you. Um, as you all know, the start for the construction, you all saw that about January, and the, the construction should be completed about December or January next year. Um, just keep an eye out for that. I think it's a really great thing for the neighborhood. I can't tell you how much, how much I fought for that thing to go in there. So um, yeah. it's great for the neighborhood, right? Yeah, it is. I think that's all we have for Thompson Neighborhood Association. Again, we have several projects going on. I need help with some of them, so I'm always looking for volunteers. Um, come out for a Ciclovia, enjoy yourself for the day. We'll have vendors, food, food trucks, car shows, all sorts of things going on. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, Richard Garcia from uh, Memorial Heights Association. <coughs> and Daniel Rodriguez, did you want to come in too? No. Thank you, Ms. Vega. Uh, Richard Garcia with the Memorial Heights Neighborhood Association. We had our meeting last week, and this is, I know I'm speaking to the constituents, the registered voters here, 
But uh, this uh, coming Saturday, I put some flyers up there. They're having a <coughs> membership drive. Uh, <coughs> it's free. It's open to the public, and it's from one to three p.m. And uh, like I said, this is not to endorse any 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 uh, uh, politics or anything. It's just information that's free and for, to register to vote. And, it's, and you want to get deputized also. That's what they're gonna happen. It's from one to three, and I, from one to three p.m. And I put some flyers up here, up on this table. So feel free and welcome. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eugenio Rodriguez. I'm with the Loma Vista Neighborhood Association, also involved in the Old Highway 90 Coalition. I just want to give you all an update on Old Highway 90. What is occurring right now is that we went ahead and gathered some money so that there could be a third party survey to be done. These will be mail outs. So if you live um, <clears throat> from Commerce Street all the way to Castroville, between Commerce and Castroville Road, and San Joaquin, and 151, to Callahan, you will receive a ballot, or you should receive a ballot. We're not sure what percentage will receive them, but please be aware this ballot will be out there, in which it will ask you if you're in favor of bringing old Highway 90 back. Uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the business owners along the corridor want it back. Unfortunately, some of them are empty lots, so it doesn't. we can't say 100%, pero como quiera, um, they really need our help. So if you do receive the ballot, uh, please go ahead and fill it out. It's a yes or no, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Okay. Now we have Amelia for this. How's everybody doing? I was going to do some stand-up comedy. <laughs> so again, uh, like Belva said, my name is Amelia Valdez and I'm the president of, proud to say, the historic Westside Resident Association. I also have the, my scribe here, Natalie Guerrero is also here. So we've been actually overwhelmed with a lot of things that are going on on the west side and that's the boundaries. If you can imagine a big rectangle inside Laredo, inside 35, inside West Commerce, and inside South Zamora, along the Alazan Creek somehow, right? Uh, demolition, which is really sad. Um, also, we have a fence that is going to go up at the um, Placita because we fought and pushed that back, but eventually they're going to put some form of fencing. So we've been working through some of that work. Uh, but we're going to work on getting historically designated, hopefully, which gives us incentives um, for homeowners. Uh, if you're 65, of course, your taxes are already frozen, right? But if you're a homeowner under 65, there's incentives under for property taxes, and there's other incentives as like home rehab and things like that. So we're, as a historical resident association, we're going to walk door to door, try to knock on doors, educate people, and if we can get historically designated, no more demolitions, we're hoping. So we're working through that, and also uh, we're working through a campaign along with the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center and the Westside Preservation Alliance. Mi barrio no se vende. Our residents are complaining that they're getting letters in the mail about buying their homes. Uh, they're getting knocks on the doors and they're getting things in their mailboxes or whatever, right? So we have these signs to kind of say, mi barrio no se vende, so don't come around here because this is very important. Now, I'm, is, they're still going to come, but this is something like this, we mean business, right? So if you want to sign, you can sign up and be a part of Cafecitos. Now, Cafecitos are little meetings that you can have at your homes, and you can talk about, you'd be surprised how many people are getting these letters, and you can have conversations within your neighborhood with a Cafecito, which is, which, which is becoming very popular now. But the sad thing about this, they're stealing the signs. They're taking them and then putting something else, like, 
a lot of profanity on them and things like that. It's like, it's really sad. They were, we're just getting a momentum of this, but we will keep pushing and push, putting these signs on the yards. So are we working to Tampico Lofts and Alazan Lofts, which hopefully will not happen. We're getting pushed because uh, it's not affordable. You're talking about 200 units, four feet high, all kinds of craziness coming. Coming our way, it's probably already coming our way. Every second Tuesday of the month, April 9th, we're gonna have an accountability campaign. We're gonna have our uh, candidates, like uh, Shirley Gonzalez and uh, Anthony Gris, to join us. And you can come and join us, bring your questions, and we're gonna try to hold them accountable for what's going on on the West Side, okay? Thank you so much. Uh, 1310 uh, Guadalupe Parish Hall at 6 p.m. And you can see me afterwards and um, I can give you more information. Okay, thank you. Okay, we also have Delia Trimble from, uh, she is the president of uh, Friends of the Library from the Spanless Library. to make sure all of you know that uh, Las Palmas Library is celebrating its 50th anniversary and on the 23rd of March and there's some more flyers over there we're having a program starting at one o'clock we're gonna have Shirley and uh, the library director uh, a number of other uh, dignitaries for our uh, formal program and then we're gonna have a reception and then family activities until five o'clock so we're gonna have a stem workshop for the children uh, science workshop that Our Lady of the Lake is coordinating for us, Our Lady of the Lake University, and um, the library itself is doing a whole lot of activities. There are going to be ongoing activities all afternoon, and then we're having a papel picado workshop at, from 3.30 to 4.30. So all of you are invited to come and help us celebrate Las Palmas Library on the west side. And again, I also, every month, I try to bring the calendars. So there are going to be calendars on the table over here. Uh, a lot of activities going on at the library this week for spring break. Uh, a, a lot of activities, not only at Las Palmas Library, but at all branch libraries. So again, uh, invite you to come and celebrate with us on the 23rd of March, which is a week from Saturday. Thank you. Do we have something, oh, Dina, would you like to say, uh make an announcement for your neighborhood association. As soon as we finish with the, with the announcements, we're gonna go on with the, with the meeting. I just wanted to make sure we break. Yes. Hello everybody, my name is Dina Serrano. I'm the Vice President of Community Workers Council. Our boundaries are from 151 between Old Highway 90 and Commerce all the way to 36th Street. Um, so we're pretty much by the highway. Um, we're having a masquerade ball. Um, it's going to benefit uh, our community. It's going to go to scholarships and um, we do feed the officers. We do that event. Um, it's going to be on March 30th on a Saturday and tickets are $20 and it's going to take place at the food bank. And we're going to have food, music. So if you're interested, please come to me and if you could donate $20. We'll give you a ticket. Thank you. What time? Oh, it starts at seven. Seven in the evening. Yes, seven to ten. Do you wear a costume? Uh, yeah, like a masquerade. Oh. <laughs> masquerade ball mask. Yeah. I'm, I'm there, Dina. <laughs> oh, at the Valero Hall at the food bank. That's where it's going to take place. So I hope everyone could join us. Big party in the West Side would be great to have. Good evening, everybody, and it's great seeing you here. My name is Henrietta Queta Flores Lagrange. I am part of this West Side, and what I'm trying to do is we're almost at the final stages of finishing a proposal. What I want is to get a minor program to, to repair homes on the west side because my heart is on the west side. So if I, I'm asking all of you, if this comes forth, I would like for all of you to join me because there's a lot of people 
like they were saying about our homes. I, I get those letters too, but I know better. Uh, they're telling these people, oh, your house is worth like maybe 20000 But they say, oh, well, I like to get it fixed. Oh, but it's going to cost you 50000 Why don't you sell it to me for 20000 We need to stop this. So what I would like for you is, um, I volunteer for a CASAS organization, and I'm the treasurer. And the treasurer has a lot of work because she's, she writes the checks and pays the bills, but I don't get paid. And that's okay. But my concern is I want this project to go forth. So uh, I hope each and every one of you, when this happens, because I see it happening, I want you all your support because there's a lot of people, even in this room, that need the help. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the, uh, the guest today. As you know, we are having a, one of the topics is understanding your property taxes, and he is the chief appraiser, Michael Amisqueta. And also, we have uh, Anita Fernandez. I think we missed somebody, though. No? What? Uh, raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Did you want to say something, Terry? Oh, okay. uh, no, you were just introducing the, the homeowners association. Oh, I did say I did say we're uh, associations. So we have Loma Park, right. Terry Kilmer, president. We also have Mr. De Leon from uh, Los Jardines. Did I miss anybody? I was going to enter. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia Spielman with Tier One and Beacon Hill. I, now I got off track. And anybody else? Did I miss anybody? No? We're good? Okay. <clears throat> we have Anita Fernandez. She's going to uh, do the presentation. Uh, the state representative can, can't be here today because he's in Austin. Her name is Anita Fernandez. And then we also have Rich Acosta. He's going to do the another presentation. And right now we're going to have Cynthia Spielman. I'm going to bring her up because she's going to facilitate the discussion because uh, whenever the presentation is whenever when the presentations are done we're going to do the questions and answers afterwards so she's going to facilitate uh, that so that we can stay on track and that way everybody gets to ask a question uh, and we can move on smoothly so I'd like to introduce Cynthia Spillman. Thank you Cynthia. Thank you Michael. So we'll have a 15 minute question and answer period after each um, presentation. We uh, respectfully ask you to keep your question at one minute. And the reason is there's so many people here and we're so thankful, but we need to be respectful of everybody's need to ask questions. Um, and the total will be 15 minutes. So I'd like to hand over the mic to Michael Amesquita, who is our um, appraiser and a really wonderful speaker. Well, it's good to see you all tonight. Uh, Anita, are you sure you don't want to go first? Mine's a little longer than yours. I, I actually I actually would like to segue into that because your boss and I work together a whole lot trying to help these people hang on to their houses. I'm happy here. Thank you. Well, I will uh, yield the floor to the lady. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Anita Fernandez. I serve as Chief of Staff for State Representative Diego Bernal, and we have a good portion of the West Side, not all of the neighborhoods that are represented here we cover, but we do cover some of you all, so we very much appreciate the invitation this evening. Um, as was mentioned by Velma, unfortunately, the representative was not able to be here today. He had a school finance meeting with the Speaker's Office uh, this afternoon in Austin, and so he had to be there for that meeting. But we were asked to be here because we have a couple of bills that will hopefully, as uh, Mr. Amasquita said, help families stay in their homes should they get through this legislative session. But before I get into that, I just kind of want to give a recap on what we're doing and where we are as an office. Uh, we started the session on January the 8th, and we are about halfway through. The session, the 86th legislative session, will finish on May 27th, so on Memorial Day, that will be our last day. 
If we do not finish though, there may be a chance that we come back for a special session. The only thing we are constitutionally obligated to pass this legislative session is our budget. So as long as we get the budget done by the 27th, we won't necessarily have to come back. But there are some very uh, high topic, hot topic issues going on right now, like property tax reform and also school finance reform. And so those are some pretty heavy lifts. And so there is a chance that we will get called back into a special session, which means we'll go back in July and work until we get to a resolution that all people involved and all parties involved can agree to. The representative sits on three committees currently. He is the vice chairman of the Committee on Public Education. He is also this session for the first time on the Transportation Committee, which is exciting for us because there are a lot of things going on around transportation, particularly in San Antonio and Bear County. Uh, so that's been a great experience for him and we hope that there will be some good that comes out for our city through that committee and he's also on a committee called local and consent calendars which allows for him to be a part of the process to determine which bills actually get to go to the floor to be heard by the entire house and the legislative body so we've been very very busy he's been very very busy and we've been working very hard um, for you all and for the constituents there have in total been about four thousand bills filed on the house side um, and so everyone is working very hard and all of those bills will be referred to their respective committees by the end of this week according to this coming week according to the speaker. So if you have questions at any time about any of the bills or the legislative process you can always contact our office directly and I have cards here as well as handouts on the bills that I'm about to speak to you all. On. So with that, I'd like to talk to you about two specific bills that we were asked to come and share about. One is known as the Anchor Neighbor Plan, which we worked very closely with Bear County Appraisal District and other appraisal districts around the state of Texas to kind of come up with. And it's actually a plan that the representative has been thinking about since he first came in um, to office as a state representative. So it's been a couple of years in the making. It's The number is HB 1102, and I'm going to pass these around if y'all want to take one um, and then this is thank you so HB 1102 is also known as the anchor neighbor plan and so we designed this bill and the representative designed this bill to keep families in their homes that's the ultimate goal and so you'll see that there's really three main components of the bill and if you skip down to the very bottom part that says solution that's where kind of goes through the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. So with this bill, we're looking at homeowners who have been in their home and paid their mortgage consistently for over 15 years, who then in that time frame, their property tax payments have increased 120% or more, and they've made no significant improvements to the home. And that's an important point. We get questions a lot there because this is if you had to redo your roof because you needed to, you had a hole or it was deteriorating, if you needed to add something to make it ADA compliant, the maintenance that you need for a home doesn't qualify as a significant improvement. We're talking like swimming pools or a huge renovation type of project to your home. And so if you can check those boxes, then you would become eligible for your property taxes to freeze at what they are when you fill out that application. So that is the basic concept of our Anchor Neighbor Plan. We ran a lot of numbers. Thank you. You can give it a round of applause. Yes. Um, we ran a lot of numbers with the Comptroller's Office. We've talked to school districts because if you do know, if you read, we're talking specifically about school property tax that's going to be frozen. And so we wanted to make sure, and the representative wanted to make sure, that we don't negatively impact the funds that are going into public education. And so with all those numbers being run by the Comptroller's Office, meeting with our school districts and other school districts around Texas, meeting with homeowners such as yourselves, because that's really where the idea for the bill came from, was constituents who went to the representative and said, I'm being pushed out of my home because I cannot pay my property taxes. And so that is the Anchor Neighbor Plan. It has been referred to the Committee on Ways and Means, which is the committee that handles anything to deal with taxes um, for Texas. It has a chairman who is a Republican, Chairman Burroughs, but it has a vice chairman who is a Democrat, um, Trey Martinez Fisher, who actually represents uh, part of San Antonio. And so we're hoping that through that working relationship and the working relationships that Representative Bernal has, that this bill will get a hearing and that we will be able to come to some kind of resolution. The one thing that I do want to point out too is this is a very small step 
in a direction of property tax relief. And so is this going to help every Texan? No, but it is designed to help those Texans who've been in their homes for an extended period of time and are experiencing this drastic increase in property tax and have experienced that. Um, the next bill that I'd like to talk to you about is HB 240, and this is your payment, uh, property tax payment installments. So currently you can pay your property taxes and installments, but it's only limited to two installments. What we're proposing is flexibility to move that to five installments or nine installments. Okay, so it's just, you're not gonna change the amount you have to pay, unfortunately, with this bill, but we're gonna try to make it easier for homeowners to pay it. This bill was also referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, we have not gotten a hearing yet, but we are gonna push, both of these are priority property tax relief bills for our office. Uh, and so if you have stories that you'd like to share, um, we for these, we may put out kind of a call for witnesses or testimony, if you will, um, if you want to share your story with the committee so they can understand how you would be directly impacted positively or negatively um, by the bills uh, that we file and bills that other offices file. And so those are the two main bills. There are a lot of bills out there on property taxes. Some may provide relief, others may not provide relief, but it is an issue that is important to Representative Bernal and something that he has worked very hard during the interim to come up with these plans and that we hope will go somewhere um, and, and end up as law after the 86th session. So if there is nothing else that you want me to address, then I think that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Amasquita. Oh, right now, okay. So if, it, if any of you'd like to have questions, um, please stand up and state your name. And please take one minute for the question and we'll allow them to answer. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, oh, my name is Since we will be freezing the school tax and our area needs a lot of funding, yes. where's the money going to come from the money that's going to be lost? So the state. That's the conversation. Well, us. That's being we are had the state. The we are well, the us as the state, as in general revenue funds and the school finance conversation that's happening. And so the idea is that the state, through funds that already exist and monies in our general revenue account, will be moved over and shifted to pay for that difference. Yes. Hey. Correct. Freeze. We're freezing it. You're still paying property taxes in. It's just the amount is stopped at that level. But, you know, if, if they continue to go up, yes, and that's what I mentioned, that it is a very fine line and a balance because he is a huge proponent of public education and would never want to cut funding from public education. And so his job with proposing this bill is in the conversations for school finance reform to find other mechanisms to put in funding at the state level to make up that difference of the burden on the local property tax. Would somebody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Anna and uh, my question is, is there an organization that can help individuals to understand the taxation process? Because a lot of times what happens is when you receive that letter, when you receive that notice, people just kind of throw it away and they don't understand the process as far as appeals and all that and and and, and that, that's what we so need that. to address. Yeah. Just wait your more presentation. Yes. Do more we'll presentation. On that. Yes. Okay. So, yes, there are. And I mean yes, you can also contact the appraisal district themselves um, and, and they will help you. But that's Mr. Amasita actually will be a perfect answer to that question. Yes, I mean, Mr. Acosta, sorry. Any other questions? Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. All right. Now the hard part's over with. I can't believe Anita left without saying, you know, Diego, when we work together, we do a lot of speaking engagements together during the tax season leading up to the legislative session. And since the last session, we've been working for two years on these bills. And we, we, we come up with something and we tear it apart and try to say, okay, how are they gonna shred this bill? And we shred it ourselves and then we, this is about the third iteration of what we've been working on over the last two years. Frankly, I'm surprised they got a hearing. There's not many people that advocate for homeowners or people that are in need. Uh, I've spent 25 years working with the legislature and I've never seen anyone quite as tenacious as your boss. He refers to himself as a Mexican, as a as a minority in 
every sense of the word <laughs> when he gets to Austin, both because he's Hispanic, he's not that tall, and he's a Democrat. <laughs> Yes, but I can't, you can make that joke, I can't make that joke with my boss. <laughs> That's actually his joke. Yes. And it's just amazing to me because he's, he really is a brutal fighter for his community. Going into that, I want to talk to you a little bit. I heard, uh, you know, not mi barrio. Well, I can tell you, my barrio doesn't exist anymore. I grew up just east of I-35, east of downtown in Austin. Uh, I think there's maybe 6% of the Hispanic population that dominated that neighborhood for the better part of 100 years gone. And so the movements that you have going, don't give up, keep fighting, keep supporting guys that are working and ladies that are working for you like Shirley and, and Diego because they're the ones who are trying to make a change in your life. I'm going to give you some information tonight and I wrote it down for you so you don't have to take notes. A uh, couple things. There's a spreadsheet like this that has a bunch of sales data, and it's just general data from the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M University, showing how values have trended since 2006 all the way through the recession and all the way back up again. San Antonio virtually lost no value during the recession. We're not a boom-bust economy in San Antonio. We've always been 2 3 4%. Uh, right now, we're actually in a little bit of a downturn. We're sitting at about an 8% increase residentially this year, about 12% commercially is what it's looking like. The important step is, let me back up for just a minute. I've got three ladies with me who are here to answer any questions about your personal homestead exemption or any other issue you may have with your house. Jennifer, my executive assistant, she's also in charge of our Facebook and Twitter. Sarah Yanez, our customer service manager, she's in charge of exemptions, customer service, and coordinating the appraisal review board where you ultimately have to go protest, and her assistant, Lisa Aguilar. These are all the ladies that do the work in my office. A um, couple things that are really important to you. When you get that appraisal notice, it's going to be coming to you on April 1st. The protest deadline, just like last year, changed. It's now May 15th. For nearly 40 years, it's been May 31st or 30 days after the date you get your notice, whichever's later. Now it's May 15th or 30 days after the date you get your notice. That deadline is not a bare appraisal district deadline. That's a state mandated deadline. So please don't miss it. If you decide to protest, you can protest at any time from January 1st until May 15th. If you want to go to my office and drop off your protest, you can do that. They'll stamp it for you. You want to ask for a copy so that you make sure and have proof that you turned it in. The other thing, I was talking with another lady who said that she kind of got mixed up on hers and the timing. You know, if you know for sure you're going to be on vacation or you have a trip planned or you're not going to be here in June or July, just put on there not to schedule you during that time frame and they won't schedule you during that time frame. We want to make sure every person has a chance to be heard. As I said, the notices for 2019 are going to be sent out April 1st, so that's not a joke. Seriously, the weekend of April 1st, they're going to be in the mail. Um, the biggest change to our notice, I can't change anything on the front of that notice. There's some uh, language looking to change some of that during this session. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But on the back of the notice, where your protest is, that's the side that looks like this. It's the other side of this sheet. There's a highlighted area that asks you to check the box in red to receive our evidence. That is critically important to you because that evidence is the evidence that we use to value your property. Whether we're talking about market value or whether we're talking about equal and uniform value, how your property compares to your neighbors. By getting that information, you essentially tie our hands where we can't introduce anything else, but you can. If you have better information that helps you lower your value, we want that information. Generally speaking, that happens at your informal process where you meet with one of my staff. Um, there's a number of ways. How, first of all, how many of you protested before? That's good. How many of you use the internet? Okay, not as many. For those of you who do use the internet, we have a couple of different e-filing options. You can, when you get your appraisal notice, it's going to have a PIN number on your notice. You can log into the system, 
can simply file your protest electronically and get scheduled to meet with one of my staff. And on that scheduled letter, it'll have another date on it where you'll meet with the appraisal review board if you don't have an opportunity to settle with my staff or if you miss your informal. The other online appeal is where you do everything online. You appeal online, they contact you back, you'll have a conversation via email, you share some data, and hopefully if there's resolution, that's the end of your protest. If not, that online appeal supplants for your, or takes the place of your informal. So you would have already been scheduled for a formal meeting with the board, with the appraisal review board. And I'll explain more to you about that in just a minute. If you're old fashioned like me, uh, you can use the mail or you can just drop it off. Like I say, you can drop it off at my office tomorrow. You should understand just because your value goes up doesn't mean your taxes have to go up. It generally does because we don't see a lot of tax rates being lowered. But the tax appraisal value in and of itself doesn't drive what your tax due is. It's both of them. The amount of the value, which is mandated by law to follow the market, which is what appraisal districts do, um, and then the subsequent tax rates that get set by all the taxing jurisdictions. On this chart, I thought it was really important that you see over in this section, the University of Texas, I'm sorry, not the University of Texas, the other university, the Real Estate Center. Yes, help yourself. If anybody didn't get any handouts, there's more here. The Real Estate Center at Texas A&M tracks information regarding metro markets and rural markets all over Texas. San Antonio, New Braunfels is a huge market. And so you'll see that as far back as 2006, they were reporting the average and median residential sale price. That's the average and then the middle part between the highest and the lowest for San Antonio was running around $164,500. All the way up until the recession, it was trending upward all the way up to 177, and then it went back down to 171. That's not much of a loss. And the year after the recession was over with, it started tracking upward again. Right now today, the median level price of a home in San Antonio is $243,945. So, very much so, like, I can't remember the lady's name that spoke to you about, let me buy your house for 20,000, you're gonna have to spend 50 to fix it there's no house in San Antonio sold for $20,000. You can't buy a lot in San Antonio for $20,000. So make sure you protest your property every single year. There's a couple of things that are important about that. If you don't protest, I'll give you your information for free. Anything you do to my office is gonna cost you nothing. Whether you're applying for an exemption, protesting your value, or asking for information, years ago, before Diego was in the house, the legislature changed the rules of engagement. If Anita called me up and said, Mike, I want to see the houses that have sold in my neighborhood because we're thinking about selling. If I want to do that, I could just give her the information. Today, I can't do it unless her property is the subject of a protest. If there's no protest pending, I can't give you that information as a matter of law. So, by all means, protest even if it's just to get the information. One of the other things is, you can see back in 2006, this is where the red shows where our foreclosures were. They're almost non-existent. They're less than 3% of all sales. Our sales volume was one of the highest years we've had, over 32,000 transactions in San Antonio, Bear County. As the values are trending this way, the appraisal district's values during that same time are trending as well, but they're trending about $20,000 below the average. So I don't think we're over appraising everything, but I do know that we're following that market and that trend is still trending upward. So we talked about the appraisal review board. Y'all know who that is? The, re the review board is just an independent panel of citizens that serve they're actually appointed, they used to be appointed by my board of directors, the legislature changed that also. And so now the appraisal review board is simply a group of citizens that listen to your appeals. They're appointed by the local administrative law judge here in San Antonio. 
So as a matter of law, they've always been paid out of the appraisal district budget. But we can't hire them. We can't fire them. We can't direct what they do. We can't tell them what panels they're going to work in. We can't tell them what days they work. And they just basically are an independent body that listen to the evidence, they make deliberations, and then they render a ruling. Once they've ruled, just like if you don't get what you need out of my staff, my staff isn't the end of the road. The review board is not the end of the road. There's three opportunities for taxpayers to avail themselves of a lower appraised value, which generally turns into a lower tax bill. Number one, this doesn't make sense for most homeowners, but you can file suit in district court. That's pretty expensive. The second thing you can do is you can file for binding arbitration which is up to $500, depending on the level of the value of your home. But if you prevail, and literally the legislation that created that law says, whosoever value the arbiter settles closest to wins. So if you prevail at arbitration, you get everything back except your $50. The difference, I have to pay to the state controller, and they pay the arbitrator. So it's very economical, if you think about it. Um, the other thing, we haven't had very many of these, but the State Office of Administrative Hearings, that's actually before an actual law judge. And that one generally involves lawyers. The arbitration doesn't require a lawyer. You don't have to have a tax agent. Uh, sometimes they're done on the phone. It's really up to the person who's bringing the appeal if they want to handle it that way and if the arbitrator will allow it. Exemptions. There are a number of exemptions that are available to all of you. Um, the over 65, I'm sorry, the homestead exemption is an automatic $25,000 off of your school tax bill. Legislature did something good. I don't say that very often. They did something really good last session. They allowed us to go back two years instead of just one. That value on the exemption is really good, but the most important value to you, especially in your neighborhoods, because your neighborhoods are considered affordable in San Antonio. They are below the average, they're below the median in terms of pricing. It's the area that's seen the least amount of growth in terms of value. So all the developers and all the home buyers are eyeing your homes and trying to buy them up because they're relatively inexpensive compared to other parts of the city. And so, that 10% cap or limitation on your value, as values continue to go up, let's just say because I'm not that great at math, but if you have a $100,000 home and your house is all of a sudden in a neighborhood worth $150,000, we still have to reflect that $150,000, but if you were $100,000 last year, you're only going to be 10% above that or $110,000. And then you take your exemptions off of that number. And so it's very important to make sure you have your homestead exemption. As I say, all three of these ladies have their iPads and we can look up your property before we leave tonight. The over 65 and disability exemption, that's very much like what Anita was talking about. The benefits that are available to anchor residents are almost identical to what we offer for senior citizens, except that the senior citizen exemption is even greater. It doesn't affect just the school district. If you're over 65, you're entitled to your homestead exemption, plus an additional 10,000, plus whatever your, your taxes are that year, your taxes are frozen. In San Antonio, I love saying this, we are the only major metropolitan city in Texas that offers this. Not Dallas, not Austin, not Houston, not Fort Worth, not even El Paso. Corpus Christi is the next largest city that does this. In San Antonio, the state mandates that your school taxes are frozen when you turn 65. In San Antonio, Alamo Community College District, Bear County, and City of San Antonio freeze your taxes at what they were the year you become 65. Hugely important, and it's a huge advantage for you guys. The 100% disability exemption for veterans, if you are a service-connected and are awarded 100% disability by the VA, and you are no longer able to work, you don't have to pay taxes in Texas, property taxes. That's a Texas statute. That's a pretty good benefit. If you're less than 100% disabled, there are four different levels. The DB1, which is the first quartile of roughly 0 to 29%, I think, will entitle you to a $5,000 discount or exemption. The DB2, which is the next level, 
is 7,500, DB3 is 10,000, DB12, I'm sorry, DB4 is 12,000. The interesting thing about the disabled veterans, not the 100%, but the DB1234, you can actually apply that to any other property you own. So if you're already maxed out on your exemptions on your homestead, but you have a little hachito or something, maybe you don't have, or maybe you have a rent house, you can apply it to any property you own, anywhere in Texas. It doesn't have to be your homestead. So those are benefits that we have, and all that information is available to you for free. Uh, we had a group, I can't remember their name, that were soliciting a lot of you, not just to buy your property. This is a different type of solicitation. They want to charge you 50% because they see that your property looks like it's your homestead and you don't have one. I just told you that the legislature made it possible for me to go back two years now. So we can do the current year plus two. So if it was this year that you were applying, you could get it for 19, 18, and 17. Some total, that exemption's worth about $250, $300 a year. If you multiply that times three years, now we're talking about money. In the old days, when it was just one year we could go back, they would charge 25, then 35, then $50, kind of a flat fee. Now they want 50%. They want you to sign up, and what you're signing is a fiduciary agreement, which is you're allowing them to represent you against my office to give you an exemption that you're entitled to for free. Any one of these ladies and the guys that work in the customer service department will fill that out for you. They'll notarize any documents you have to notarize for free. Everything we do, the state of Texas mandates me to do it for free. We don't charge you for anything. There's very little things that you'll be charged for, aside from additional copies. But if it's on your property, you're not going to pay for anything. Please don't pay anybody to file an exemption for you. Um, I was going to talk about those bills, but I think they already did it, so I don't have to do that. The benefits that are allowed under uh, HB 1102 are very similar to the type benefits that are allowed to the senior citizen's exemption, and it freezes the taxes. As Anita was mentioning, whether we're talking about the anchor residency bill or whether we're talking about the actual over 65 that exists, your value is not going to be increased because you painted your house or put a new roof or changed the windows. That's normal maintenance. If you added a pool or you added another wing or you added a thousand square feet or you built a new garage, that's different. You don't lose your freeze, they just add that value on top of it and whatever taxes are due on top of that get added to your freeze amount and that becomes your new freeze. Here's the interesting part. If at any point in time the combination of your current tax bill, your rate plus your value equals something less than your freeze amount, you always pay the less of the two. And that's in the law, that's not a policy. And so I'm going to close with that and I'll go ahead and take a few questions. And then if you have any specific questions you want to talk about later, we'll stick around for that too. So um, people are available after the meeting, um, the staff, to help you with any specifics about your case. Please, again, to be respectful um, of the people, your neighbors here, uh, limit your question to one minute. And we hope that you'll take any questions that are specifically about your case. We have experts behind us that will help you after the meeting. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. How many people are being sued right now because they're behind in their taxes? And what is the interest rate once you get behind? I'm not that guy. Um, the tax collector, I don't collect any taxes. But I do know that there are some very specific time frames where taxes go to I want to say it's 8% right off the bat, and I think if it goes through July, they add a percent a month until it hits a max of 20%. That also is by state statute, but that's a collection function. We don't do any collections in my office. We just value property. But you know how many people are behind? I don't know. That's, that's not something I do, but I know it's it's... It's not as bad as it was, but there are a lot of people. There are lists that get published uh, three or four times a year, but I don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. But that is, you could make that in the form of a public information request of Carlos Gutierrez okay. at the Bear County Tax Office. One more thing. Yes, sir. You know, there's a little, I have a little habit of 
dropping people's homestead exemptions? Y'all send the letter out, and if the letter don't come back, y'all drop the homestead exemption. I think that's very unfair. That's okay. very, very unfair. I'm glad you brought that up. Anything else? Are you going to stop doing that? Uh, no. No? That's terrible. Well, I just want to explain. Whoever, whoever needs to whoever, whoever that needs to be fired. Okay. Who is that? That would be my fault. I work on it. Who? My fault. Your fault? Your fault? I'm the boss. There's the man. Let me just say that the law requires us to do diligence. And if we send out a reapplication letter and we don't get one back, the law says then that property is to be removed. We don't just drop it. Well, so let me ask you. The person got a homestead exemption, how can that go away? Because oftentimes people move, people get married, people leave property to their kids. Those kids are not eligible for the same exemptions that the previous owner. Yeah, but you guys know all about that. Beg your pardon? Y'all know all about that. We have more questions. Did you yes, yes. Uh, I just want to address the group on that. Mm. I, I went to help a friend with the taxes. And then I read, yes, I do. And and her son was there who's a lawyer. She says, my mother gets one every year. No, what I wanted to address to him was, I applied for the appraisal review for it. And when I went, I was interviewed and they told me, the person is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through some questions that they're going to ask you. And you know what he told me? We have a lot of crazy people coming in here. And I said, that's not a good thing. And that's why I was not selected, because I reported that person. Okay? Do you mind if I ask when that happened? Uh, I think you know, because it was addressed to you. It doesn't ring a bell. So. Uh, it was. And, and I can tell you exactly who I spoke to. Okay. And the person is still employed. Because I addressed it. And it was not good. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a new homeowner, and I'm wondering how often does the homestead application have to be renewed? How often does the homestead exemption have to be renewed? Once you apply for your homestead, we generally do not remove those. We have 400,000 homestead exemptions. Right now, we've only sent out about 10,000 reapplication letters out of 400,000. So once you have it, unless we haven't heard from you in 10 or 15 years, we're not going to send you a reapplication. And what, do you, what would, what would, um, what would signify whether or not you've heard from us? Whether you filed an appeal, whether we've had any change in the status of your exemption, if there's been added exemptions to your homestead exemption, that contact makes it very obvious that you're still there. We don't have any way of verifying that. And so I know that we are currently working with a firm here in town to try to find a way to identify folks that are, look like they're eligible. Uh, we share information with various cities, water, uh, garbage collection. If we can match up enough things that point to the same address for that person, we want to send them an application so that they can get that. You know, go and live. A lot of people that just won't apply because they either don't have a state-issued driver's license or a state-issued um, ID, and that's one of the requirements of the law. And my other question was, do my other question was, does does the person who is School district that you reside in, does that dictate what your property value, your tax, you know, property taxes? It, it can. It can have an impact on it. I mean, everybody knows that if you go west of 281 and you're in Alamo Heights, that's one thing. If you go north and you're in northeast, that's a different thing. If you go south of Alamo Heights and you're in SAISD, that's a different thing. They all may have their own share of high values. But people tend to want to be in a certain school district, even within a particular school, a school zone within a school district. So, you know, um, I know Hubner Elementary in Northeast is very popular. It's right in front of Churchill Estates. If that is a highly desirable area that doesn't have a whole lot of single family around it, it does, but there's also a lot of apartments. There's a lot of people that move into that jurisdiction just for that reason. So, yeah, it can. And on the other with that being said, because I moved to the south side. I previously in the medical center. So I noticed when I was looking at the tax information, SEISD, our tax our tax rates really high compared to the Lotus. And I was like, why is that? Schools are suck over there. And then 
schools are great over here. I hate to say that, you know. But I'm wondering if that's the case. Why is it so much higher in NCISD? You know, um, I'm just trying to understand it better. Right. And you know, there, there's a couple of things that come into play with school districts and their tax rates, and a lot of it doesn't have anything to do with the school district. It has everything to do with the funding formulas. School districts are required to tax at their maximum tax rate in order to maximize the amount of state aid they may be eligible for on the backside. Uh, Edgewood, Southwest, Southside, South San, San Antonio, uh, those are all Chapter 41 school districts. 41, Rich? 42. 41. 41. They're actually 42 school districts, so they would be eligible to receive money. Northeast, I think Northside, Alamo Heights, those are Chapter 41 school districts. They actually pay money that they've collected locally back into the recapture. That's the whole Robin Hood plan that you hear about. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. I think this lady was focused, okay. but I'll get, I'll get to you. I just wanted to know the information that you gave us previously. Is that somewhere we can pull up online? Or you have. Actually, these are just reports. I can't give you the data behind it until you actually filed your appeal, and then I can give you all the information you want. Uh, we're not allowed to post any of that information on the internet. Okay. You have flyers with that? We do have more up here, though. Okay. And it's just general San Antonio MSA information, no specific property. Yes, sir. My name is Lalo Le Young. Yes, and I'd like to ask you, uh, what are some of the things that will uh, decrease your property value? Okay. That's a really good question. If you have a neighbor that doesn't keep up their property and you have to look at it, pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, if you have structural issues that we have not taken into consideration, you have doors that won't close, windows that won't open, pictures are really helpful. Uh, if they're date stamped, it's even better. Um, if you have estimates for repairs, that'll help us establish how much dollar value to assign to that discount. And if you do have a foundation issue, even if you haven't repaired, we're never going to remove the entire discount because you're going to have to disclose if you ever sell that property. Your agent will tell you you're going to have to disclose that the property had structural issues and you had it repaired. So we don't ever take the whole discount off. Questions? Okay, uh, the first one deals with the process you mentioned of notification for the removal of exemptions. What is the procedure? How much uh, outreach do you do or notification do you do? That's, to a, the that's a great question. This is one of about a hundred meetings I'll do before the end of April. Uh, but we also put all of our information on Facebook, on Twitter. We do the required publications in the newspaper. And if there is someone that you know who had their exemption removed, if it was dropped, we can still go back, even if it was dropped two years ago, and add that back on there. If we removed it in error, we can put it back on. Yes, ma'am. He's asking for the process, the steps we take. Oh, all before we do in, in terms of getting? The, before we remove it. <laughs> Boy, that may be a Sarah question. <laughs> I don't do everything in the office. Yeah, um, like Mike had said, um, when, when we've had absolutely no correspondence with anyone for 20 years, um, we do actually send out batches each year just to kind of check on, you know, if, if someone's still there. We want to make sure also that, that everyone knows that there are more exemptions available than there were when they first applied. So we want to make sure that they're getting the ones that they qualify for. Um, so we do actually, when we send those out, there are letters and reapplications. Um, we send those out at least two times. Um, and yes, if we don't hear back, we don't hear back anything at all from them. Um, we actually will check it in our system, and see if we can find any information. And, uh, and yes, those do sometimes come off. Um, That's sort of uh, not from those ones, right? But uh, as far as if they're over 65 exemptions, we do actually send another two more mailings. Um, one is a 60-day mailing that is certified, and the next one is a, another 30 days deadline, so another 90 days that we, you know, for over 65 uh, accounts. Um, and so, yeah, so there's steps, and we do, you know, we try our best to, to get that information out there, but we also you know, we want to make sure that the records are correct and that, you know, if someone moves out, a lot of times people don't know to come and tell us, you know, hey, I moved out, I'm going to take my exemptions off. Um, and so we, we, we have to, you know, make sure that everything is correct. Follow-up question, you 
mentioned uh, a firm that you all are dialoguing with to, I think, assist in identifying individual property owners that qualify for exemptions. Are you at liberty to disclose the name of that? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, there are actually two firms. What's the other one? Uh, one of them is LexisNexis. The other one is the Linebarger Law Firm. They have a different agency that does. We were actually talking about doing homestead audits. And one of the reasons we do these audits is because, let's say that um, I'm over 65 and my taxes should have been $5,000 a year, but I was only paying 1000 because if they were frozen so long ago. And my kids inherit my property, and I never had that exemption removed. Well, now they're looking at the difference that I paid versus what I should have paid for five years back, plus interest if I don't pay it. And that's by statute. So I could be saving my kids a $20,000 tax bill just because they inherited my property. I have a question. So if somebody moves, they get, they're living with somebody, they move out of their residence, are they still allowed to take that exemption? There's a couple of ways, especially the elderly. If you're elderly and you move out of your home for up to two years, you can still claim your homestead exemption. If you're, you know, uh, before my mom passed, she actually went through some surgery and then she spent almost six weeks in a, a hospital and then she had six months in a rehabilitative hospital. That whole time didn't cause her to lose her exemption because she would have still been qualified because the state permits up to a two-year letter of intent to return. And so that is helpful. We can do that. What we find most often is um, I'm a young person. The lady I married is a young person. She owns her home. I own my home. Now we're married. The law only requires me or her or both of us together, one resident's homestead. And those are the ones that we typically see falling off. One last question. Who will be paying for that, uh, that service that you mentioned? The service? Um, if it happens, and there's no proof that, that they can actually make it work, what these guys do, both of them, uh, a lot of offices use them, these batch processes that Sarah sends out, 10, 15,000 at a time every other year, whatever. They actually scrub the whole file and they try to find everybody that's disqualifiable because we find that they have a mailing address here, they have a, an electric utility over here, and yet they're claiming this is their homestead. But it looks like everything's pointing to another property. That's kind of a simplified way of how that system works. They use that to scrub data to pull property off the roll. That's their main business model. When I heard their pitch, I asked them, is it possible to switch that around to help me identify homeowners that look like they're getting their garbage picked up here, their water bill is here, their driver's license is here. Can I send them a homestead exemption? I don't have any way of identifying all those things. I don't have all of that. If it does come to pass, it'll come out of my budget. Yes, ma'am. She's been waiting a really long time, but I'll come back to you. Pass away. I had a friend. Her dad passed away uh, about 15 years ago, and then she tells me, oh my God, now I have to pay all these back taxes because she never reported it. She, you know, the husband was a will to her, but she was still paying the taxes that her dad was paying. And she didn't realize, you know, about the tax, you know. So do you all ever receive that information so that automatically you can uh, address it? There's not really a good way to answer that. I mean, the fact of the matter is, when she gets an appraisal notice, it has all those exemptions on there. When she gets a tax bill, it has all those exemptions on there. So the law requires that the taxpayer take responsibility. If, if her parents that she inherited the property from didn't deal with it, then her as the new owner should have dealt with it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I know that the tax office does payment plans. I don't know much about that beyond that. I don't do any collections. but. Uh, one thing I will tell you, I don't really like talking about these things because I don't think they're really good, but on the other hand, if you're trying to decide whether you're going to pay your taxes or whether you're going to buy your medicine or whether you're going to buy food, if you're over 65, you have a tax deferral affidavit that you can fill out that simply freezes your taxes. I mean, it stops, you don't pay any more taxes, and there's no more tax paid until you sell the property or until uh, your estate settles the property. 
however long that takes. So that may be another option. I don't know how old that person is or if that would help or not. But. So we only have five more minutes for question and answer, but Mr. Amasgita will be here afterwards as well as his staff to answer any, any specific questions. So maybe one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, you might have touched on this question already, but uh, say uh, you said it decreasing your home property value, you save your neighbor doesn't keep up this property or whatever. What if there's a uh, registered sex offender within certain quarter of mile? Would that decrease your sex? I mean, I mean, would that decrease your property tax? Richard, this is not good. I know, I know, I know. That kind of part of it. I have really pretty grandkids, so I monitor that very closely myself. You know, to be honest with you, if there are enough of them in a certain area, I don't know if a sex offender, that means a whole lot of different things. Uh, you don't know what they were convicted of, but I will tell you this. If there are enough of them in an area that the market recognizes that they're not willing to pay to be near that, then yes, it will cause it. But we don't make those judgments. We look to the market to see what's happening. If homes were selling for 80000 and now we have 10 sex offenders in a 20-block radius, and now they're selling for 50000 that's an identifiable difference. And we have to take that into consideration. The number one thing, and the reason I talk to you about your individual properties, we have to do mass appraisal. We look at a lot. We're, we're appraising almost 600,000 houses at a time every year. So we're going to miss something. We still are required by law to look at the individual characteristics of every one of your properties. And that's why, you know, if you want to do it online and do an appeal, that's fine. I think you lose the ability to interact with another person. Uh, you know, I, I'll be real honest with you. The market has been so tight for so long in San Antonio. That's why you're seeing the prices creep up. A normal market is considered to be six and a half months of supply. We haven't had a three-month supply in, since 2011. That's a long time. And so markets that were previously not desirable become more desirable. I saw it about three years before my mom passed. She got really ill and she was at uh, St. Francis. And I entertained the notion of buying this little house on the corner at Craig and I forget, I think Ripley, right across from St. Francis. And I thought, you know, surely I could buy that for 100,000. It was listed for 162. It sold for 170, and it hadn't been remodeled. That's when I first saw it, and that was about six or seven years ago. And you can drive by that house today, just before you get to the railroad tracks, there are sugar cane about 20 feet tall. You can't even see the house anymore. So I'm sure that if, that was, if I was living next to that house, I'd take a picture and say, I hate this house. I hate this house. Uh, that counts. Do we have time for this gentleman? One more. This is it. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Henry Rodriguez, uh, Executive Director for New Life Concilio Zapatista. Yes, sir. We really appreciate what, you, what you're doing here today and the group that put it together. Uh, it's to me, it's uh, Texas 101 here. And um, my, my comment is this, that we want to learn as much as we possibly can because there's a lot of suffering going on regardless. You do a good job, yes, but there's a lot of suffering going on, so it behooves all of us go after the, after the subject, have to go after the process and do whatever we can because we got to stop the bleeding, bleeding somehow. Thank you. That's really good comment. I just want to follow up. We just acquired a couple of uh, videos uh, regionally prescribed for Bear County, be it English and in Spanish, to explain the process to anybody who wants to view it. They're online at WW. It's not there yet. It's coming. How far? How about another week or so, maybe two. You know how the government works. But um, should be before you get your appraisal notice anyway. And it just kind of gives you a real, about a four-minute video. It's in English. It's in Spanish. It's the exact same uh, information, just in two different languages. Also on there, you'll find Jennifer's Twitter and her Facebook. Every time we're speaking somewhere, just because we're in a different part of town or a different neighborhood that's not yours, if you have questions and you didn't get answered and you want to come there too, by all means, come on down. Sometimes it's a big group, sometimes it's 200, sometimes it's 12 of us. You know, it doesn't matter. We want to get that out there and give every, everybody their opportunity to go through the process. I will tell you this, last thing. I've already instructed my staff because I think commercial property 
is getting a much bigger break as a matter of law. And so what I've instructed my staff is we have a margin of error that we have to work with according to state tax policy. And so officially, Bear County Appraisal District has adopted the tie goes to the taxpayer. If it's close, you're going to get your number. I think they can you know, but I'll stick around. Our, our website is www.bcad.org. It's on the brochure. There are brochures here up front as well. And we're not going anywhere. Thank you so much. I also wanted to mention that right now they are videotaping it, and I think you all got this little card. It's now cast, so you can you're able to look it up online and you can view it on YouTube. Correct, Jolie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just remember, you can uh, view it. And, and there's also uh, we just updated it a link to all the places you can go to get your taxes done for free. You just type in your address, and it tells you all the hours, all the locations. And there's a lot of different services. Some people will fill it out for you. In other places, they just give you free access to a computer where you can do it all online. So that was updated yesterday, so it's all okay. up today. Thank you. If you want your sign, I'll be right over here. <laughs> okay, now we're going to bring up the next, next presenter, and this is also good information as well. So please stay tuned. Cynthia Spielman is also going to facilitate uh, to make sure we stay on track and questions after uh, the presentation. Thank you. Richard Costa, I'm so sorry. Hello everyone, my name is Richard Costa, president of Misudades Mi Casa, my city is my home, and we help you protest your property taxes for free. We're a 501c3, and at no cost to you, uh, we will help you protest your property taxes for free. Uh, I ch uh, we're a group of volunteer licensed real estate agents, and we and I train uh, real estate agents how to protest their property taxes, how to help you go through the entire process. We'll help you with the evaluation of your home. We'll get you free contractors estimates for your home and help you with the entire package. And the other services that our nonprofit does is we help low income renters find homes. And then uh, by the end of this year, we're going to be building brand new homes for displaced homeowners. These homeowners are being displaced because their taxes are too high or their home is in disrepair. So we're going to build them a brand new home, uh, sell their old home to pay off the home that we just built them so they can continue to be homeowners. But anyway, getting back to protesting property taxes. So in April, when you get that notice saying that your property taxes valuation is this much, well, you can give us a call and then we'll go in and we'll do a valuation and see whether or not we believe that is a fair market value. And if we don't believe so, we'll do an assessment, we'll get you all the evidence that you need, we'll get you the contractor estimates that you need, and then we'll walk you through the entire process. We'll go to the informal with you, we'll go to the formal with you, at no, absolutely no cost to you. Again, with is a 501c3 nonprofit, no cost, and uh, that is our... I think we have flyers uh, in the front. Uh, if you raise your hand, we'll bring the flyers to you. A um, couple of things that I want to add in there. We also double check to make sure you have all your exemptions. So we'll make sure that you have your homestead exemption. Uh, check it and make sure that you have your senior exemption, all that. Now we also ask that seniors still uh, think about and have us come over and help them assess whether or not they should protest their property taxes. Even though that your property taxes is frozen, not every taxing entity is frozen. The river authorities portion is not frozen, and the university health system is not pro uh, frozen. That's just a little bit. They're not a they're not a huge portion of your taxes. But if you're on a fixed income. Every little bit, every year that goes up, it takes away from your grocery bill, takes away from your medicine bill. And so we'll go through and we'll help you assess and see if we can bring that valuation a little lower, which brings down how much you're, uh, you're paying the taxes or that little bit of increase that from those other taxing entities. Also, I, I like that he brought up uh, uh, that the that uh, you can defer paying uh, property taxes if you're over the age of 65. Again, what he uh, said is true. Do, uh, it doesn't go away. It accumulates with an 8% interest as well. And so those property taxes, 
it still accumulates. But it's a good it's a good answer for somebody that you know that that taxes that that portion that you're that's frozen that you're paying is is affecting you from paying your grocery bills, paying for your medicine and everything. And so there's different ways that you can go about that, and we can go ahead and have and talk to you about that kind of stuff. I train my real estate agents uh, on uh, on that information as well. This is not a brokerage. We ask real estate agents from different companies to come and volunteer, and I train them all for free, right? And so if you know any real estate agents that and are interested in this kind of stuff, please send them over. I'll talk to them. I'll train them for free and have them uh, get part of the team. Uh, and then if you don't know any other groups, homeowners, and everything, please let them know. It is a free program. I'll help you protest your property taxes for free. Um, all right. That's really quick. Do you have any questions? My name's Rich Acosta, or Richard Acosta, and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a uh, my city is my home. Mi ciudad es mi casa. Sorry, oh, ma'am. I have a question. Yes. So, do you provide um, a facility any kind of gathering for senior citizens and not senior citizens? They're the ones that need most of the help. I'm not saying nobody else. Does. So, so let, let me get that. So, BCAD, I, I always say BCAD is not the enemy. They, they don't have the ability, like real estate agents do, do, to go inside your homes, right? We can go inside your homes and see all the different stuff in there. If you got an entire neighborhood, right, and there's 20 homes on that block, and six of them has been flipped. BCAD does not know that th your home hasn't been flipped. They just see the value of the area that has been, uh, uh, the, the flipping has happened, they sold for more, and they don't know that your home hasn't been flipped or anything. So what we'll go through, and we'll go and visit your home, we'll pull up the analysis because we have access to information that they don't have access to, and we can see what the differences are, and then and really point in onto that. So when we do, so when a real estate agent does a CMA, a comparative market analysis, when we're selling your home, it's the same kind of analysis that we're going to do when we're trying to help you protest your property taxes. Now, when you get that notice and you need our help, one of the things that our real estate agents are going to ask you to do is get that evidence packet. Because what's different from the CMA that somebody, a real estate agent does to sell your home is that what our real estate agents will do is do an assessment on all the homes that are on that evidence packet. So if there's 20 homes on that evidence packet, we're going to do a comparable analysis to every single one of those homes to, to make sure that we're getting you down to the fair market value of that home. Home number? Yes. Home number, address for your location. My phone number is 210-802-9900. Our website, where you can also log in, go on to and put your information and ask for our help, is mycityismyhome.com. That's the same thing as our email address, is mycityismyhome at gmail.com. Ma'am, all the way back. I'm glad that you're offering the service because as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm trying to put something taxes last week and I Unfortunately, the informal didn't go well because I wasn't prepared, and so then I went ahead and took pictures and did everything I was supposed to do. So when I got there, they really gave it to me because they said, there's one home in this area that was sold for 120000 so therefore, your house went up 20000 okay? So then they gave me a listing of all the homes in that area, right? And then I, I said, but wait a minute. My neighbor's home did, was not increased, and this other home was not increased because they tried to say everyone's taxes went up across the board, but that really that didn't happen. Only to selective homes. So that's my problem: is that not everybody homes in the area gets um, uh, an increase when you have a few homes being sold, you know, at that you know at a very high price. So. I, that that's my concern, and I I don't know how to address it, but I'm glad that this agency is now out there because you know it's like you know, and then I I have an offender very near my home, and when I brought that up, they said that I that had nothing to do with it. 
Uh, as far as we know, uh, we are the only nonprofit organization that provides this uh, free resource throughout San Antonio. I could be wrong. Could, uh, I know there's churches out there and other groups that may do so, but I feel like uh, as far as I've been heard, I heard and uh, I've been going doing presentations, we're the only nonprofit in San Antonio that will help you protest your property taxes for free in the entire process. So, um, the, and that and that is why we started. I'm a I'm a uh, a veteran. I I, was, I did a, I was in the Air Force for 11 years. I got out in 2017. Me and my wife moved here to San Antonio. She's sitting in the back. She goes to UTSA uh, for architecture, uh, and uh, we started a few businesses together. And uh, we weren't, there was no reason for us to start a nonprofit. That wasn't why we came to San Antonio. We just kind of like ran into this by uh, going to city, trying to learn about the city of San Antonio. And then we just ran into these issues that were going on. And, uh, and uh, Maria uh, Betty Ozabal, uh, she challenged us to start a nonprofit because I complained. Uh, uh, about why the city has do, does uh, have a process like this that helps uh, residents protest their property taxes throughout like a a person to person level. Yes, the BCAT uh, are, are great. They're, they you go there, they give you all the information. I use their customer service line still. I call them up. They they're really friendly. They'll answer all my questions. But he, they don't have the staffers to go to every single person's home to help them out personally throughout the process. Well, I do. I got tons of volunteers ready to come by. Sir, by any chance, does anybody consider uh, a percentage of a person's income? Because, like with my grand, with my uh, parents, their taxes were frozen years ago. So, uh, it's if they had to pay the full tax right now, it'd be about three social security checks or two social security checks. Well, well, that that respect, that's when I would tell you, if he's over the age of 65, he can defer paying property no, no, no. taxes. Oh, okay. And they have to pay the full amount. If you talk to the tax collector's office, uh, they they will, no, but they will work with you to... to but, it, but let's say they pass on, let's we'll say that it's, if they pass on, it's so going to be like 15% of my pay if I take over the new tax so this area the price is the the Um so 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 what well so what I what I when it goes to helping seniors, one one of the other reasons why I ask seniors to protest their property taxes, and I and I hope I answer your question into this, is uh, not just because of the little bit of it increases uh, through throughout well, the, the years. No 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 yeah, exactly. And yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, so what I'm saying is that's a sec that's another reason why seniors should protest their valuations because if they don't protest their valuations this entire time, right? Because and they didn't really care about that extra increase or didn't notice it enough to say anything, their valuation could be going up a little by little by little, and protesting that valuation even though it's frozen will keep it at a fair market value. And so that way, when you do inherit the property, you're not being taxed at a value that's not fair. Well, we have $7,000 home for used to be. Now they're going up to about 20, now they're 50. And now we have homes being sold for 150000 175000 small lots and stuff. I would, I would like to speak to you afterwards, so, since this is more of a specific question. If I could talk to you afterwards, I'll go down to the details with you. Well, within that, no, it's hurting a lot of people out there. I think I need to talk to you just to understand it better then. Yeah. Any other questions, please? Yes, Secretary. Um, first of all, thank you for the 11 years of service that you gave. Thank you. Um, thank you for the service that you gave. Thank you. I have a problem with the fact that you're going to have to pay the
foundation or whether it needs a structure or whether the neighbor has a family trash yard and their house is in value. So this I am proposing and I hope that you agree uh, to have some sort of because even some of the senior citizens as you said they would be good in this room because they have no knowledge of what that means. So having a meeting and bringing in constituents from district five I can guarantee you that you're more than willing to and knowing that you state facts that you will help them they have no problem. I'm not a state legislator or councilman, but yes, that's great. <laughs> I would love. Uh, that's why. That's why I'm, I, I. I really, really need your help to like spread the word because I can only be in so many places at once. It's like everyone else over here, you know. Spread the word. We, we want to come out and help. I'll speak at any event uh, invited to. Um, one thing that we also do too, when when we go and help people, when we help low income renters find homes, when we help homeowners protest their property taxes. We ask them if they would like to do a needs assessment, and that needs assessment, we ask them, do they need help with employment? Do they need help with transportation? Do they need help with medical services? Because we have, me and my wife, we have other businesses, and so we have these nonprofit programs, but we're not trying to become a silo and create more and more and more uh, things, right? What we try to do is create uh, create a partnership with different organizations, and so that way, when they do that needs assessment, they need employment help. We connect them to a representative in Goodwill, you know, because they have employment help. We rep we connect them with a, a medical uh, Medicare uh, service provider that can help them through that process, and so that way we help them a little bit more beyond just protesting property taxes. Okay. So, so uh, she was saying, so part of our, our, our thing, like when we help people, uh, low income renters find homes, we'll help any renters find homes. So basic, so one example is if your rent's too high, as your, your landlord increases your, the amount of your rent and everything, uh, what we can do is you can give us a call and we'll find you a real estate agent that will help you find a home. Why are real estate agents are, are, are volunteers in this respect? Because your thing is like, well, doesn't any real estate agent help you find a home? Well, a lot of times if it's a low income and a, a low rent, uh, landlords won't pay a real estate agent a referral fee, so they won't help you out. Not because they're an evil real estate agent, it's because they got a family to feed too, and it takes time to help you find a home. Well, our real estate agents that are volunteering will help you whether or not we get a referral fee, whether or not we get paid, we don't care, we're going to help you find a place. So if you know anybody that's in that situation where their rent is too high and they don't know where to go to, we will help them find a home. And that, that was very good information for all of you. Uh, they will be staying here uh, to answer any more questions or look up your address to see if you do have a homestead or, or something like that. Anyways, I want to thank everybody for coming out and hearing this hearing this presentation. Thank you.